Welcome, everybody, to week uh, week four of, <laughs> of our 1.2. And we're going to cover some of the most famous uh, pieces of sculpture and paintings, both, uh, that have ever been created in, in Western art, including David. We're going to start with that, Michelangelo's David. But the first thing I want to do is just double check with anyone if anyone has any questions about uh, their papers or any of the other, I sent out the requirements. Now I know we had a couple of people join just as late as the third week, which I encourage that. Here we go. But uh, that means that I think I didn't have a chance yet. It's not a town for five or six years to the point uh, where I didn't have reliable internet service, but I was able to post the videos from last week. So you should have no trouble finding those on YouTube if you missed any or you, okay? All right. Uh, so a couple of students, I think, who joined within the last week uh, might not have yet gotten all the handouts. Uh, but the good news is I, I go slowly and I spell the names from the syllabus. So if you're one of those people who still didn't get the handouts, I can get them to you tomorrow because I don't have them on my laptop. It only has so much storage space and I'm mostly storing my videos on that. And I think you all know what I mean about that. You can have a computer crash, which has happened to uh, everyone in my family more than once, if you put too much stuff on one uh, device. So, so tomorrow I will get back to anyone who says they still didn't get any. You just need to say what class you're in to remind me of that, okay? Isaiah, welcome, we're just getting started. Okay, um, any questions now? It's a good time to ask. Uh, and I'll stick around afterwards again, as always, which are my unofficial office hours, with any questions following the last slide. But right now, does anybody have anything really urgent they want to ask about regarding the uh, papers or any other questions regarding what we've covered so far? Nope. Hey, okay. Mark. Yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, yeah, I have a question. I can wait until the end of class. I'd like to have you confirm very succinctly the nine elements of form or art. Um, uh, I've obviously read our books and in different places, they talk about seven, they talk about nine. They talk about eight where eight. Well, Sarah Gill's book is specifically the one that has nine, and that's why I assign that as the main reader required text, I mean, for writing your papers. Um, um, we've already I, kind of done that uh, a couple of times. You know, they're in the video, too. Rather than do that, because we have so much to cover. I mean, I'm not trying to deflect your question. It's, it's, well, I'm, if I'm, you still I, want me to, I'll, ask, I'll, I'll go dig up the... because. Believe it or not, I have them almost memorized. It's only been 24 years I've been teaching this okay, class. Good. I'll take I'll take that question at the end of class. Then. Yeah, but uh, don't forget, for everyone's sake, not just yourself, but anyone who's listening now or records this and watch. I mean, watches the recording. You guys can get um, all of that information uh, on uh, the uh, recorded YouTube videos because it's there with uh, behind my back. It's actually on R2.1. I send emails about this, two, two, two emails at least, but I will go over them again if you want me to. Okay, but any other questions that have to do with the requirements of your papers at this point? Because they're due two weeks in the day, remember that. All right, so let me do the speaker view thing so that we can get to um, the first slide. And that will be David, I'll go ahead and give you the title. And let's do the screen share. So famous that everyone here, I gotta believe everyone has seen this at some point in their lives. Let's move this up here and get this maximized. Okay, so here's our first must know. Now, you might not need me to tell you this. I am not cutting this slide from the study list. It's so important. It literally was a, uh, the word seminal, I think I've used that word, you know, something that breaks new ground in the world of art, a seminal work of art is one that has some new techniques or new stylistic innovations that artists first used on that work of art, or at least that was the first famous work that that artist used. And why that means uh, something seminal is that that means it would have influenced all the other artists trying to create that type of art following after that. Okay, so th this is a seminal work of art, no question. Um, all right, why do we say that? <clears throat> well, let's start with the title as usual. It's very simple, one word, David. Uh, and of course, you know by now how to spell the artist's name. We've already covered 
uh, at least one of his, or two of his slides so far, Michelangelo, right, with a C-H, Michelangelo, 1504. Yeah, M-I-C-H, in case you don't have the handout of the uh, syllabus, M-I-C-H-E-L-A-N-G-E-L-O. That was his first name. He always signed his work by his first name. He was that famous. He was known all over Europe and North Africa and the Middle East, too. I think I mentioned the Sultan of Turkey. Look how far away that is, uh, the way across the Mediterranean, uh, tried to hire him to design a bridge across the, to the strait that divides Europe and Asia. And he almost agreed to, but then he got forced to do the Sistine Chapel by the Pope. Okay, why are we looking at this and calling it a seminal work of art? Because, here we go, the meaning is there's so many things to say, I'll just hit the main points. Here we go. This was the largest or tallest uh, human figure ever carved out of a single piece of stone that we know of. I'll say it again. This was the largest human figure ever carved out of a single piece of stone that we know of, or you could say known figure ever in you know, recorded history. That, that's a pretty amazing statement. I mean, I know some people must be thinking if you studied ancient history, what about the Colossus of Rhodes? That's not a single piece of stone. <laughs> it was put together with many, many sections of stone clamped together with metal clamps. Not the same thing. This was a single piece of marble. So here's the next fact about it. Michelangelo carved this figure from a piece of marble that was 19 feet tall, which no other artist wanted to try and use. It was so big. It was too big. In fact, it almost got broken in two pieces and sold to two different people. But uh, he saw it and said, I'll use that. I'll take that uh, piece of marble and paid someone, of course, <laughs> I didn't do it himself, to drag it all the way down to Florence into his studio, and he created this masterpiece. Now, you probably know the story of David. I assume most of you do, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on something that should be well known, but just briefly again, you remember this is the shepherd boy named David who's mentioned in the Bible having killed a giant enemy warrior named Goliath in a famous battle in the Bible. It's mentioned in the Bible. So, this depicts him before the battle. This is a very important part of the meaning. So let's get up close and see his expression. Let's do this where you can, whoops, lower it down a little. There we go. Look at his eyes and look at the set of his mouth and even the turn of his head, you see. He is looking at Goliath, who is not dead. This is different than the one we saw last week. Remember, we saw another David by Donatello. It was the first one done during the Renaissance, at least famous figure of, of, Donna, of uh, David. And that one was after the victory. Remember, that's after, uh, you know, David had already killed Goliath and cut his head off. Not so, this is the opposite. This is before the battle. And this depicts, here's the phrase Michelangelo himself used, so you can put it in quotes in your notes. Put it in quotes in your notes. It's uh, his own phrase to describe the state of mind of this figure that he created. He is, quote, action in repose, or he symbolizes action in repose. He's resting temporarily before he has to exert, you know, life or death. I mean, he's either going to win or die. Those are the two choices in this battle because they've sworn to kill each other, these two uh, warriors or heroes. For, he was from the Isra Israeli you know, side, and I can't remember what, it doesn't matter. What, the enemy army sent Goliath to fight him. So not, instead of the battle, they just agreed they'd settle that war with one contest between those two warriors. So it's a do or die for both him and his country, right? It's pretty important, pretty intense moment. And you see it in his face, his expression, especially his eyes. Um, if you've ever been an actor, I know, some of you probably have done some acting and, you know, even back in high school or college or wherever. Uh, <clears throat> there's a phrase actors use, centering, you know, just before you go on for an audition or literally even after you get a part and you go on stage, you have to gather your, your you know, focus to do the task, whatever it is that you're asked to do. So in this case, he's doing the same kind of thing on it's much more intense than acting a part. It's the future of his own life and his people that's at stake so he is intensely focused on his enemy 
and the battle about to come. So it's before the battle. Okay, the only other things to say about the meaning is that this is in contraposto. I gave that definition last week and uh, I'm not gonna repeat it now, but if you didn't see that lecture or you joined the class since then, one week ago today, uh, the definition is not on your handout. That is, you could say an oversight on my part, but you know what, it only relates to the meaning of each of the few, I think it's four slides that have proposed where the uh, statue, it's for statue. So I'll go ahead and give you the definition again because it's not on the uh, list of terms to know listed out separately on its own. So I'll give that to you again, in case you weren't here last week. This figure is standing in contraposto, C-R-O, sorry, contra, C-O-N, I'm sorry, contra, of course, is in Espanol to be opposed. Right? It's, a, it's a word, some of you speak Spanish already know that word, C-O-N-T-R-A, and then P-P-O-S-T-O. You don't have to worry about the correct spelling of any word on the uh, list of terms to know. Only the ones on the syllabus have to be spelled correctly. Don't forget it's an open book, midterm and final anyway. So just write it down the best you can, but that's the spelling with two Ps. Okay, contrapposto is a pose for statues uh, with three features. Number one, the weight is on the back leg. It would be this leg. All right, let's go down and you'll see it. Weight is on the back leg, the front leg is loose. Number two, one arm is raised and the other is down, usually holding something. Well, he's holding the rock that he's going to use to kill Goliath. So again, one arm is raised. You see that one arm is down, usually holding something. Sometimes both arms are. Okay, obviously here both are, but always in contrapposto, or almost always, the lowered arm is, is holding something. All right, and then finally, the spine, number three feature for contrapposto. The spine forms a gentle S curve. That's how people really stand. That's how people really, really when they're relaxed or you know not standing at attention. It's how normal human bodies are posed when they're in their relaxed state. Of course, he's not relaxed mentally, but he's, you know, gathering his strength. All right, the only other thing, last thing now about the meaning is well, why was this created? Well, it's the same reason, a political piece of propaganda, there's your alliteration for today, you can write that however you want, but it was a piece of political propaganda because it was commissioned by the government of the city of Florence, of course, where Michelangelo lived at that time, to be a symbol to their enemy to the north, Milan. The big city, Milan, is much bigger than uh, what I, Florence is maybe a little bigger than, than Santa Rosa. Milan is like two, three or four million people. So Milan, their big neighbor to the north, their enemy, the enemy of Florence, was threatening the people of Florence. So the government of Florence hired Michelangelo to design the statue. And if you remember the lecture from last Wednesday of the other David statue, the message is the same. If you attack us, the Florence government was saying with this statue, if you attack us, we'll do to you what David did to Goliath. And there we go. So that's the last point you might want to include about the meaning on this. Uh, now it is a, a footnote, which could be part of the meaning if this is on the essay part of the final, I mean the midterm, it won't be on the final, uh, it might be on the midterm, high possibility. You might want to add that it was damaged by an accident, couple of boobs, <laughs> idiots, were moving furniture on an upper floor. It was it was posted down. You don't have to write this much you want to. It was on uh, the uh, pedestal like it is now, uh, in a plaza just below the town hall. Uh, if you've been to Florence, you may know that it's called Palazzo Vecchio. Anyway, that's their version of city hall. So, so their so-called city hall, we'll call it, uh, was uh, several like two hundred feet tall. It had a big tall tower, right? So somewhere in the upper part of that tower. Some uh, people were moving a heavy piece of furniture. I think it was like a table, you know, just a big piece of wooden furniture, and they accidentally uh, lost it out the window. <laughs> How they did that, I don't know. It's well documented. That piece of wood fell, you know, over 100 feet easily and knocked the arm, one of the two arms, I assume it was this one, right off the statue. And of course, chipped and damaged it. So it had to be repaired. And ever since then, the statue has not been displayed outside, um, which, as you know, if you've been to Florence, I think some of you said you had, right? You go to a museum to see it. 
it's in a museum, along with other Michelangelo statues and other Renaissance sculptures. You don't have to add that last part, but it's an interesting <laughs> footnote. Okay, uh, let's do the form analysis and move on to the next one. It's balanced, well, by human nature. I mean, hum human physiques are balanced when they're standing, um, you know, like this, of course, uh, left to right and top to bottom. Uh, then we have the rhythm, of course, again, an intact human body would always have, of course, this all, all will have rhythm with the two arms, two legs, two hands, two feet, and the face. Then the cement texture is superb. Michelangelo was so good at doing this that he, he explained how he created these lifelike sculptures by saying, oh, I merely free the spirit that's trapped within the stone. Wow, that's a pretty impressive statement. In other words, he was inspired by, well, back then they would have said God or divine inspiration to guide his hand. You have one wrong blow with a hammer and a chisel on a piece of marble that big, and you just ruined how much, what, a year? It took him over a year to do this. Toward the end, let's say you made one wrong move, <laughs> one mistake, and the whole, it's amazing. It had to be perfect. Every single blow, thousands of blows of a hammer and chisel to create something this big out of a block of marble that was, oh, I forgot to tell you the height. Let's do that now, the, the, the space. Here we go. It's uh, still formal analysis uh, we're doing. Space here is real. It's three-dimensional uh, human uh, figure, which is three times life size. It's 16 and a half feet tall. Or nearly just under that. So I'd say almost or nearly 16 and a half feet tall. The average person back then was about five, the male was about five and a half feet. That's three times the height of a normal adult man. So it's colossal, if you want to write that way. That's the literal definition. Two or more times the size of life size, it's called colossal. <clears throat> so that's the space. There is some overlapping. You could make the case, I guess, of course, that his hand overlaps the slingshot and the, in the stone, his hands. And I guess one leg overlaps its tree, a stump. But otherwise, it's all real space. Uh, then if you break it down that way, he's the largest mass, then the tree stump, and then probably the uh, slingshot, as you can see more of it than the rock. Um, all right, and the color, of course, it's cool, cool white marble. There's no modeling, just the lighting from the museum that creates these shadows. The cement texture is superb, and that's on the hair, of course. Let's get up close and you'll see more so. And the muscles, of course, everywhere. And even the fingernails, the veins, every part of his body, every detail is super sharp and realistic cement texture. And of course, that is all done with carved line. And then he is mostly stable because he's standing upright, but the bottom half of his body is slightly tilted more so than the upper half. Remember, he has a slight S curve, so you could say it's, it's almost equal parts stable and dynamic because this forms a pretty much of an upright line here, but his legs do veer off so that. They're dynamic, and of course, the top of his head is good. All right, moving on. This is not a must know. I, I used to have it on the list, but I just want you to glance at it. You don't have to write any of this. This is uh, the second largest sculpture he ever created. Black Lines made this for a church, and where it still is sitting in exactly the spot he carved it. Uh, and this is Moses near the end of his life. And he's looking across at the quote, promised land, meaning Israel when he led his, you know, the former Jewish slaves that got out of Egypt escaped, of course, with him leading them, or were actually allowed to leave, right? <laughs> it's in the Bible, whatever, you don't have to write in this. And so it shows him at the end of his life. That's why he looks like, you know, older man than Charles Heston did, <laughs> if you ever saw the movie, The Ten Commandments. Um, so supposedly he wandered in the desert for 40 years, and he died at 70, so that means he was 30 when, uh, you know, he freed, quote, led his people out of Egypt. So that you don't have to know any of that, but it just, it's pretty impressive to have a piece that's more detailed than David, because look at all the robes he's got and the footwear he's got, and look how long his beard's become, because he, he didn't uh, cut it at all. And it's, this piece would be 15 feet tall if it stood up and he's seated. So it's about, uh, I think about 12 feet tall. It's, it's colossus. Second largest sculpture, Michelangelo. All right, now we get to the next must know, a uh, one that I'm not gonna cut from the study list. And here's the title, The Birth of Adam. You know, as in the Bible, right? The uh, character from the Bible. The Birth of Adam is the title. Again, I already spelled Michelangelo. He's the artist, Michelangelo, 1512. 
We kind of covered this the first week of class, but some of you weren't you know, with us then or, or joined later, so I will repeat this. This, let's go to the actual panel. There it is. That's the view, of course, the close-up that you'll have if it's on the midterm. This one won't be cut from this letter list again. It's very important, so make sure you take good notes. So what we have here is one of 18 panels. These main fact, first fact I mean about the meaning is that it's one of 18 panels that are scenes from the Bible and they are frescoes painted on the ceiling of a chapel in Rome. And if you want to be more exact, it's the Sistine Chapel. Remember that if you want to spell it correctly, it's not S-I-X, it's S-I-S-T-I-N-E. But you can just say a chapel in Rome. And again, if you want to be correct, it's not technically Rome. I think some of you know that it's a separate city within a city called the Vatican, where the Pope lives. But you can just keep it simple and say that it's on the ceiling of a chapel in Rome. Uh, okay, but what does it tell us about what's happening here? Well, this, as you might already guess, the guy with the beard, right, is supposed to be God up in heaven. And he is granting life to Adam. According to the Bible, supposedly, Adam was the first human being. Of course, we know that there's plenty of other <laughs> theories or evidence to you know, dispute that, but that's what the Bible said. So what is the job that uh, was given to Michelangelo by the Pope to interpret literally what the Bible said and make paintings from various scenes that were considered the most important parts of the Bible to illustrate the beliefs of the Catholic Church at that time? Okay, well, that's an important fact. It's a literal interpretation of a scene from the Bible in which God reaches down with his, you know, power over everything, right? He's the ultimate universal power, right? And he's granting life. You could even say energy. That's so famous. Everyone's seen this, right? And just these two hands have been used for hundreds and hundreds of advertisements, websites, you know, uh, movie scenes. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's, it's an iconic image. This is definitely an iconic image. So what we have here is a literal interpretation of the moment in which God reaches out with his hand to touch, supposedly, you could say, pass the life force or give life, to say it either way, into Adam's then at first lifeless body. So he's just coming to life. But you know what? It's not that simple. There's something else going on here. This is the part I like most about this painting. Who is this woman? She's up in heaven with a bunch of, uh, there's a share of a baby angel, right? Another one. And then here's some more, you know, grown up looking angels, right? All surrounding God. But who is this woman? Anybody have a, we don't know for sure, but anybody want to take a guess? Who could it be? Eve. Yeah, that's a good guess. That's the logical explanation. It could easily be Eve. But does anybody know what, according to the literal interpretation of the Bible, is a problem with that assumption, which is a very logical one, and it could still be that it's evil. What did the Bible say about who was alive first or who God created first? Yeah, man was created first. The, yeah, according to the Bible, which is the basis that some people feel and you know, it's an understandable argument that that's the basis of some of the prejudice against women since way back in ancient times, or at least since the Bible was written, uh, that man came first. And then women were, a woman, Eve, suppose he was created out of part of Adam's body. If you took the Bible literally, then that can't be Eve, can it? Because this woman is not unaware. Look at her face. Look how intelligent and how full of, you know, uh, energy she is and how intent her expression is. So can anybody else, I doubt too many of you know, but I don't know if any of you know about the early texts that predate the Bible, the Jewish texts. I forget what they're called now, but you don't need to know that much detail. But there is a woman that supposedly God created before Adam and Eve. Anybody know who she was called? There's a whole group of women uh, performers before the <laughs> pandemic anyway, that toured together. Um, and, and they use the name of this figure from the early pre-Christian Bible. Okay, um, Lilith, Lilith, I think that's who it is, L-I-L, 
I T H. Lilith was a female created to keep Adam company down on earth, who somehow started out, she was the one of God's, you know, companions, you know, friends, you know, sidekick, whatever you want to call them, um, assistants in heaven. And he sends her down to earth to be with Adam. But she wouldn't obey him. <laughs> this is the part that really fascinates me. And, and there's whole research, there's even books about this. There ought to be a movie or a play. I mean, supposedly she just wouldn't, you know, knuckle under, whatever you want to say, give in to his trying to tell her what to do all the time, because supposedly he, Adam, thought he should be, of course, the dominant person in that couple. And uh, before they even started having, trying to have a family, before they even had children, he asked God to take her away because she was disobedient. And God, according to these early Jewish texts, banished Lilith to the far ends of the universe where she's been creating demons and sending them down to earth to wreak havoc ever since. <laughs> now, it's, you know, not something most of the people have ever heard of, but some of my uh, scholars, Jewish and Christian, have studied that part of the uh, early text before the Christian part, before Jesus comes into the picture. So here's what you should be writing now and keep it simple. There are two leading theories as to who this woman is. Either it's Eve, but the problem with that, that you should be writing, unless you already know this, is that she, according to the Bible, wasn't created till after Adam was alive. And clearly she's already alive and aware and frankly looks a lot more intelligent to me than he does. <laughs> That's Michelangelo's making a statement here. The other possible figure is Lilith, I already spelled her name, which would be a woman who existed in heaven and was sent down to earth to uh, be a yeah, companion to Adam, but would not be obedient and God banished her to the far end of the universe, then later created Eve. Either way, the last part of the meaning here, I would add to your notes, it shows that Michelangelo did not buy into the stereotype of women being subservient or submissive to men. We know that because he had very close friendships with women. There are some evidence he might even have had possibly one or two intimate relations, but there's no proof of that. We do know that he also, uh, you know, ha had some close male uh, friends as well. So he, he, we don't know. He could have been bi. We know Da Vinci was, was gay, no question, and he didn't hide it. Michelangelo probably repressed it if he was, but in any case, he was friends, close, very close, uh, you know, like platonic, uh, you know, respectful friendships. He, he kept for years, for decades with, with powerful, intelligent women all over Europe because he was known all over Europe. And so he could go visit them and they would be, you know, willing to host him and he'd have his own room. And then he would exchange letters in the meantime when he was back in Italy. So just keep it simple. Say he had very many good friends or just say several keep it Simple, several friendships with powerful women and he respected their intelligence. We know that, there's no question. That isn't true of a whole lot of other, most people, most men back then anyway. The smart ones, some artists, but not even all artists thought that way. So he was ahead of his time, no question. And showing a powerful, intelligent, independent woman. There we go. A powerful, intelligent, independent woman pre-existing the birth of Adam. Whether it's Eve or Lilith, either way, he is breaking the stereotype that the Catholic Church, well, I'm amazed that this didn't get painted over at some point by a later Pope or even the Pope that hired him because it, it completely contradicts the, the literal interpretation of the Bible that all the other panels adhere to, if you see my point. So it's amazing. It's a remarkably advanced image of a strong, independent, uh, intelligent woman, not subservient to any man. Okay, formal analysis wonderfully balanced. If you, if you measured the area of the rock back down on earth that uh, Adam is just starting to come to life, he stretched out on, and this cloud, so-called cloud, some people think it looks like a human brain with a brain stem. I don't know about that, but it's supposed to be some kind of, you know, up in the sky cloud, we'll just say cloud or cloud-like uh, structure where God is, is uh, you know, hovering. They're almost the same size. And of course, there are more figures in the cloud-like structure, but the area covered is about the same. So they're roughly balanced, kind of a diagonal here. And then we have the largest mass clearly God, but not by much, then Adam. And then I guess you, you decide if it's the rock, maybe third of Adam he finds, or this cloud-like structure. The colors are, of course, cool on uh, the green and blues of the rocks on Earth and the purple of the cloud-like 
uh, structure up here and then God's robes, but all of the, of course, these are models from Italy, I assume who pose for this. Uh, skin tones here are all, always considered warm. But there are clearly, I'd say as much if not more warm colors as there are cool. The bold outline is typical of Michelangelo. You see it here? On the main figures, there is bold outline. You notice it, you know, more so in, when you see the real piece. Sorry, did anybody, I, I think I asked this, but I can't remember if anyone answered yes. Has anybody today here with us today in this session been to uh, Florence, been to Italy? Anybody? Hmm. I thought in your bios, one or two, you said you had, well, if you ever go, you definitely will want to see this along with the other 17 panels. They're 65 feet above your head, but uh, you can you can bring binoculars in with you, and I would recommend that <laughs> to see the detail. Okay, and then we have uh, the rhythm, of course, of the arms and hands and legs and heads. Uh, and similar texture, as you can always count on in Renaissance painting, no matter who the artist, if they're competent and successful or famous or anything, always the similar texture is superbly sharp and realistic on the skin, the hair, the rocks, the clothing, such as it is. And modeling, same thing, strong, realistic modeling. It is almost entirely dynamic. Most Michelangelo paintings are, I don't see anything stable. There's no right angles here. Uh, and for space, we have overlapping and foreshortening on the rocks. I wouldn't say on the figures in up in heaven or or on Adam's body, just just uh, overlapping uh, with only foreshortening perhaps on the background on Earth. Okay, um, balance rhythm. I think that's it. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> I'm going to cut something here. Let's see how we do. We're doing really well on time. Um, Let's see, did I keep this or cut it to done something? Um, I'm just looking ahead to see if I need to cut one more. Actually, I think I already did cut this. It's uh, Tim Pietto. Yeah, I did cut it. So you don't have to take any notes on this, but just quick reference to like 90 seconds. This is the prototype for the uh, entrance to St. Peter's or the front. You could say the facade is the right word, right? The main front of a building, it's called the facade. <clears throat> if you're from Indiana, the word is pronounced facade, F-A-C-A-D-E. You're gonna hear that word, it'll come up, but not, you don't need to write it now, because this is not a slide that's on the syllabus. But just so you know, it's it's a small version of a temple, which the architect who designed it, was not my client, was a rival for designing St. Peter's, and he won the contest against Michelangelo, which many historians think was a big mistake for the Catholic Church, but they didn't pick Michelangelo's design until after this guy died. Decades later, they came back to Michelangelo and said, it's unfinished, we can't finish it. We need to have someone who's a good architect finish the rest of this church, St. Peter. So you're gonna see the evidence of that next week, actually. So Michelangelo ended up designing the dome. We're gonna see the dome today, but this is not his work. This is a man, you don't have to know his name, Bramante was his name. But it's a beautiful little, it's not miniature. That would really seem like it's you know, small enough to pick up and move around. It, it's a functioning temple owned by the Vatican right behind the main one, behind St. Peter's. Um, but I think it's just used for storing, somebody told me when I was there last time in Italy. Um, but in any case, it was designed as part of a contest to see who got the uh, award, if you want to call it that, or prize of getting the commission to design the largest church ever built. It still is St. Peter's. We'll talk about that when we get to the Massimo slide of it. This is just to give you an idea of what small little, you know, trial balloon type or test run, whatever you want, prototypes, right? Where prototype buildings might look like. Uh, architects often do that. They design something small first to show they can do a good job in order to get a bigger commission. Well, speaking of which, here we go <laughs> to the next Massimo. This is the Dome of St. Peter's. It's actually the first one listed on week four. And this one is also very important. You could guess that anything by Michelangelo or da Vinci, I won't be cutting to the study list, but I'll say it again in case you didn't already know that. You wanna make extra special careful notes for this one and study them closely because it has a high possibility of being on the midterm. Okay, again, the title is the Dome. You don't have to write the, you know, give us a Dome of St. Peter's. And that's of course like the first name, Peter with an apostrophe S. And of course, Michelangelo and the date is 1564. So now you should be writing what I was just saying with that last slide. This is 
the last work completed by Michelangelo during his lifetime. Actually, it wasn't totally completed, but he got to see it erected to the point where it was functional, which is the goal he had had since he was a young man. In his 20s, just say young, you know, Michelangelo in his younger years, in case of what he was in, it's like his late 20s, wanted that commission to design St. Peter's, which was going to become, and it still today is, the largest church on earth. It hasn't been surpassed by any building, any church that is since then. So that's a big deal, right? To be an architect of the largest church ever built. So he wanted it and he didn't win. So this dome is part of his original plan, his blueprint, you know, his drawings and a model. He created a wooden model of it. So he just kept those, of course, with him wherever he traveled. He traveled around a lot, just like the Vinci. You know, he didn't stay in one city. So he took his plans, you can skip his own and model if you want to add that, for this uh, uh, plan for the church of St. Peter's with him for decades. And then near the end of his life, he gets called back literally 50 years after he submitted his, his original proposal, the Catholic Church called him and said, they, not literally, they, you know what I mean? They sent a letter, obviously a messenger and told him, please come back to Rome. He wasn't in Rome then and uh, complete your design because the other design was unfinished and they realized it wasn't as good. So how rewarding would that be? He ought to write that. If you had done something when you were in your 20s, as many of you going to do, and maybe 50 years later, you get a chance to complete it because the people who rejected it the first time said, oops, we made a mistake. We should have picked you. I, it's one of those nice stories that doesn't happen in the history of art very often. You have to write that. Now, you do need to write this. Why is this a seminal work of art? This dome is the prototype. Another way to write it out. Say this slowly and repeat it. It's a very important fact. Probably the most important fact about it is that this dome became the prototype for dome buildings all over the world for the next 400 years. There aren't a lot of dome buildings being built in this century or even late 20th, but up through the early 1900s. If you doubt that, take a look at the San Francisco City Hall. I think most of you know what it looks like. It's on the news all the time, right? Been to San Francisco, you've seen it at some point. It's Prototype is this stone. Same thing with the state capitol building in Sacramento. And yes, the US capitol building, of course, in Washington, DC, and many other buildings around the world, not just in the US and in Europe. There are buildings in Asia and even parts of Africa that use domes, which were inspired by this dome. So this is the seminal work of art, or specifically of architecture. Here's the reason why. There are five features Michelangelo introduced on this dome that no one else had used, which are used, were then for the next 400 years, used on many, many other dome buildings. And here they are. Okay, I'll say them slowly there. So you should, you know, you don't have to number them, but that might be an easy way to put them in your notes. Okay, the first of the five things that he used on this dome is an unusually tall drum. The drum is the base of the dome. The dome actually begins here where it curves upward. Technically, the whole thing is called a dome, but to be accurate, the base of it is called the drum, just like with a musical instrument. So the drum is very tall. Look how tall the drum is. It's probably about down 40 or 50 feet, or at least 35 to 40 feet. So just say a uh, number one feature, first feature he, he used for the first time is an unusually tall drum. Okay, the second feature were tall, narrow, paired columns lining the drum. I'll say it again, tall, narrow, paired columns lining the drum. All of this, the point of all this is to draw your eyes upward, your view or your vision towards heaven, of course, towards the sky, i.e. ultimately it's supposed to be towards God. Okay, then we have an elongated dome. It is, most domes go, you know, like half circles, right? They wouldn't be bigger than that or higher than that. So an elongated dome is the third feature that no one had done before. The domes are always half semicircular, right? Like half a circle. Okay, so elongated dome is the third feature. And then we have ribs lining the tall dome. 
the ribs also add to the visual impact of the upward thrust, that's what architects would call it, right? Of the building, the way it's designed and the way your eyes see it, your, your vision perceives it. And then the fifth feature is an unusually tall cupola. Now, cupola, let's see, did I put that on this list? I think it's from the medieval class. No, I don't think I did. So a cupola, right, is a room resting on top of the roof or dome of a building. Obviously, this is resting on top of the dome. So C-U-P-O-L-A, it's not a separate standalone definition. So it only relates to this slide, but you should have that last thing, number five feature in your notes. An unusually tall cupola, well, look how tall that is. I mean, there are people standing there. If you look closely, see them? They are running around six feet and look how much higher the, the cupola behind them goes. By the way, what is a cupola for? With a church, at least, the cupola is to let light into the dome, extra light, and also to allow a viewing platform. Well, literally, that's what these people are doing. I think since 9-11, people haven't been able to go up there. Though I had a student say they'd been up there a few years ago before COVID. So maybe it opened for a while, but now it's closed again, the last I heard. But originally, people just could, you know, pay some kind of a fee and go climb up a huge number of stairs. You know why? Because here, let's do the formal analysis. The height of this dome is over 330 feet. It is the tallest structure in the city of Rome. And I guess this could qualify as part of the meaning or the formal analysis under space. It's a real space of a dome, an open dome space, which reaches a height to the top of the cupola, which is also open, by the way. This isn't solid, this is a big open room. Uh, so the entire uh, height of the whole structure from the floor to the top of the cupola is about 330 feet. It's the tallest structure in the city of Rome. And there is a law in Rome that no building can be as tall as this dome. So you don't see a lot of skyscrapers. There's some, but they're much, shorter than most big cities. We're always like 8 million people. So it easily could have, you know, dozens of 50 or 60 story buildings, but it doesn't because of that law. That was a law passed, I guess, during the Renaissance so that no one would eclipse or overshadow the height of this dome. So it's about 330 feet. That's a real space in an open domed room, right? Okay, the, the next part of the formal analysis, the color is almost entirely cool, off white, right? And then there's the warm red brick at the very bottom of the drum and a little bit of a uh, kind of a reddish color to the plaster on the wall of the cupola, but mostly it's uh, cool, off white and, and uh, off, um, kind of greenish gray on the dome. The materials are real. The texture is a real smooth glass, stone, and metal, the dome itself is metal. So there's not really, there are a little bit of cement takes, but you can ignore them. They're so hard to see these little garlands of flowers, but they're so small, you can just ignore that. The line here is all visual line used to, right, uh, at the corners, I mean, in the edges of the windows and each of these ribs. So there's no carved line you can see closely. If you get up close, you can see again on the flower. So just say the lines are visual. The largest mass, would be the dome, then the drum, then the cupola in that order. Uh, and then we have the modeling. There's no techniques for modeling with architecture. It's just the shadows created by the sun. And it is stable on the columns and around the windows, but dynamic, almost the whole thing is basically dynamic. It's round, of course, and the dome is curved. The cupola is round, but there are a few straight elements, mostly these columns. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's it, right? Okay, this is an important work. I know that sounds, well, we're kind of, you might say it's front loading here, but this is a really important one because it's the only one we have of Raphael, who was one of the three great painters of the Renaissance. Raphael was a younger artist, younger than either Michelangelo or da Vinci. So this is his most famous work. Okay, School of Athens, R-A-P-H-A-E-L, School of Athens. 1511. Okay, why is this considered so important? Because in Raphael's work, he combined, the best word is synthesized, it's with a TH, the techniques of da Vinci and Michelangelo, both. Now, how did he do that? Well, let's take a look at this. This is a scene from 
his imagination. It's a totally, you know, just an imaginary scene in which most of the famous philosophers and scientists of ancient Greece all got together in one place at one time. Well, of course, they lived over centuries, so they couldn't have. But again, it's an imaginary scene, I'll say it again, in which uh, the greatest philosophers and scientists of ancient Greece got together in one space. But what space is it? It's the unfinished walls of St. Peter's. It's a part of the building Michelangelo didn't design and wasn't finished when he came back to finish that project. So this is how the artist, Raphael, imagined the building might look. It wasn't even this near, nearly done. It was just maybe part of the wall. So he's showing what he thought that the finished church might look like. Uh, and it's, so it's, he said it in, in other words, the building that was being built next door, St. Peter's is right next door to this. This is in the Pope's apartments. It's on the wall of his library. It's a fresco on the wall of the Pope's library for him to look at every time he wanted to be inspired. And these two men are Da Vinci with the beard, or is that Plato? And then the other one is Aristotle. And that would be uh, one of the more recent sculptors, but we don't think that's Michelangelo because this is exactly what Michelangelo looked like. He was in his 30s when this was done. So we're pretty sure Michelangelo is the disgusted looking sculptor leaning on a piece of stone, uh, you know, because he was being forced to paint the ceiling of the chapel right next door, right? And then, of course, we also have this man is both Plato, the ancient Greek philosopher, and Da Vinci, we know Da Vinci looked like that. Da Vinci was still alive when this was created, this work. And Raphael met them both. He admired them both, both Da Vinci and Michelangelo, although the two of them were rivals. Raphael was friendly to both. And then we have uh, Bramante, the man who was the architect that created the first version of St. Peter's, which was still being worked on. So he was still alive, Bramante, B-R-A-M-A-N-T-E as a Greek philosopher, we're not sure which one. It could be one of the, the uh, men who invented geometry, perhaps Euclid, that's one thing. And over here we have another ancient Greek philosopher measuring things for his students on a, what looks like a portable blackboard. But one of the features most people don't really notice is the self-portrait. That is a self-portrait of the artist in a black beret a self-portrait of Raphael. So he put himself into this painting. In other words, to summarize the point is that these figures, many, not all of these figures, uh, have dual identities. One is an ancient Greek philosopher and the other as a Renaissance artist. For instance, oh, Michelangelo, I didn't say the Greek identity is a famous sculptor, Greek sculptor who created many famous sculptures that you've seen of Greek figures. His name was Myron, if you want to write it, you don't have to know that. M why are we in? So we have a dual identity happening, and that's something that you remember from Botticelli's The Birth of Venus. So that idea wasn't new to this piece, but the idea of synthesizing, there's the last part of the meeting now, I went to a formal office, uh, synthesizing two techniques, one by Michelangelo, which is the bold outline. Look at the bold outline, it's very obvious on these figures when you get up close. On all the main figures, there's a bold outline. He borrows that from Michelangelo. And the other is the Da Vinci technique of showing the inner thoughts and feelings of each of the main figures by their expressions and their poses or body language. So you see that technique, the Da Vinci technique, is revealing their thoughts and feelings. Now, this, this could, you could see how it could be an ancient Greek philosopher like Plato. And I guess this would be Aristotle. Some say it's the other way around. That's a sort of debate. But these two together are two of the earliest. Uh, Greek philosophers, Plato and Aristotle. But the da Vinci identity is more obvious because he di directly, this face is directly taken from People know what da Vinci looked like. He was really famous by this time. Pointing upwards towards what? Heaven, the truth, knowledge, whatever, you know, in an argument or discussion about some philosophical law. Okay, so that's the whole meaning of this. It has the dual identity features that were used already before in Neoplatonic painting by uh, Botticelli and others. 
but the combining of Da Vinci and Michelangelo's techniques that synthesizing is what marks all of Raphael's paintings. He's considered one of the three greatest painters of the Renaissance. There isn't too much debate on that. That'd be, of course, Da Vinci, Michelangelo, and Raphael. Okay, formal analysis we can do pretty quickly. It's pretty straightforward. It's completely balanced. I mean, look, there's an equal number of figures, you know, here and here and arranged right to left. Some people feel because the human figures make in their minds the weight greater at the bottom, even though I think of the ceiling as being of equal weight and the arch above them, but you decide that. I think it's balanced both top to bottom and left to right, but definitely left to right. The rhythm is just so obvious here with all the details of the architecture on the ceiling, the sculpture, the steps, the human bodies, arms, hands, legs. See me a texture, that, that's a given. You don't even have to think about it. With a Renaissance painting, it's gonna be super sharp and realistic wherever you look. So you just decide which details you want to mention if it's on the return, uh, you know, hair, clothing, skin. And then the same with modeling, very strong, realistic modeling. The colors alternating warm, cool, warm, cool. You can see that all the way across this group of figures and the same in the, the bottom row of figures. Okay, um, it is stable on the human figures, except for this guy sprawling on the stairs. Some people think that's Socrates, but I don't think so. Doesn't look like what we have images of what's happening. So we don't know. Anyway, just some other Greek philosopher. He may be dynamic, but every other human figure, the one standing up, right, upright, and most of them are, are stable, and the walls are stable. The arch above them and the ceilings, of course, are dynamic. Uh, and then we have the, um, let's see, what, oh, space. Here we have scientific perspective. Now, you could make the case that this is register light because these figures are down below. This guy's in the middle, these, these two. And the ones farthest away are on the top uh, section. So you could make the case that that is a more recent, you know, Renaissance use of the technique of register light. But definitely, you'll have foreshortening on the building, overlapping, of course, diminishing size, scientific perspective. There's a vanishing point. I don't know if I see atmospheric perspective. I don't see a blue hazy look here because you don't see the horizon. Okay. And as I said, the lines uh, are, are mostly bold on the human figures and thin on everything else. Okay, this is a juicy piece of work that literally will, it shocked people at the time, so much so that it was almost banned by the Catholic Church when it was first painted. This is Bacchanal, B-A-C-C-H-A-N-A-L, Titian, T-I-T-I-A-N, Titian, uh, and the date is 1513. This depicts a drunken orgy, but even by the standards of other paintings, there have been other paintings before this of drunken orgies that have been done during the Renaissance, right? But it goes further than most had ever done. So some people call this a seminal work of art. All I would say is it, it breaks new ground when it comes to hum sinful human behavior. Okay, why? Well, people getting drunk itself is not unusual in art. But they're overdoing it, let's put it that way. The excessive drunkenness is part of it. It's only part of what made this controversial. Like this guy, look at him. Quite literally, he's tipsy. You heard that word? He's about to probably break this over his or someone else's head. This glass pitcher is half full of wine, right? And here's a woman who's literally, see, she's holding up her, her uh, goblet saying, it hit me, literally. She's not even looking. For all she knows, somebody could be putting poison in a cup and she could drink it. She's so, you know, getting so drunk, she doesn't care. And then we have this man already, Bellotto, this older man on the hill, he's already had too much to drink. These people are definitely in the East too, over here, of course, literally drinking off in the corner behind the trees. I mean, clearly these people are behaving irresponsibly, but that's just part of it. The excessive drinking, okay? Then we have, questionable scene here. I've had our, our students debate this when I was teaching this course in person, in the class with me and with each other. But there's two interpretations. This could be two women dancing with each other or a man dressed as a woman dancing with a woman. Either way, that is against the teachings of the Catholic Church, no question. First of all, she's by the standards of that day, quote, I'm using the phrase of that period, scantily clad, right? So she's showing too much flesh. No question that was uh, a taboo that was being broken by this artist. And then this one here, the same thing, right? You can see most of this man or woman. See, the head looks like a man, but the body, clearly this is a dress. So 
there's a, no certainty here about this, whether the model or the artist's intent was to show the man just acting like or dressing like a woman or a woman who happened to, you know, be muscular and to women getting obviously amorously attracted to detail. That obviously would have been considered not acceptable by the teachings of the Catholic Church. But the last and most to me saddest, and I think the worst of all the excessive behaviors, if you can call these that, depending on you know the teaching of that day, but even today, this would be considered not appropriate behavior. A mother who is so drunk that she doesn't even know her baby son, obviously a boy, is being drenched in alcohol. That's what you call an early ticket to alcoholism. There's no question that that kid's going to grow up with two strikes against him. A mother who's a wall, right, or a parent, whatever, who's just not there for him because she's too too out of it, and also because he's hanging out with these adults who, you know, give him drinks or otherwise pour alcohol on him for whatever reason, accidentally or deliberately. Doesn't matter. He is going to not have a very happy childhood, and that's a sad thing. So this was a sermon, you might say, in paint, oil paint, of course, against these kinds of uh, sinful activities that the Catholic Church was convinced was okay because the painter said that's why he did it. Titian was a Venetian. Now, you don't have to write it that way, but that's how I first uh, remembered who he was. He's the first famous Venetian, as in from Venice, right? Venetian painter. So I call him Titian the Venetian. I don't think you'll see that in your textbook. Will you write it however you want? He was the first famous painter from Venice. And so he was, you know, trying to make it you know, in a very competitive field of painters from all over Italy, right? More famous than him. And so this painting helped establish his reputation. And it almost cost him his career because the Catholic Church objected until he explained it the way I just did. That's the last fact about the meaning. That this is supposed to be a warning against such behavior. Let's do a formal analysis. Well, this has scientific perspective definitely has atmospheric. You see it there on the hills and the, uh, the water below, uh, I mean, at the horizon, I mean. Obviously, it's got overlapping foreshortening. You begin to be able to do these things, I think, for yourself, hopefully by now, because you should be starting to write your papers now. Uh, there's dimension size. See, there's a group of people here getting drunk and halfway back to the, the uh, horizon there. And there's a ship that probably brought them there from the mainland. It looks like an island. <clears throat> Orgy Island or whatever they called it. Uh, and then we have overlapping, of course, and uh, foreshortening on uh, some of the human figures. Um, then we have simulated textures, superb fits given as that's authentic, especially noticeable on the leaves of the trees and the clouds. He even did the cloudscapes, super realistic. Titian was a master at cloudscapes, by the way. One of the first painters to, to put a lot of attention into his clouds. <laughs> They're super realistic looking like real clouds would be on a day like this. Uh, and then of course on the robes and the skin and the hair. Uh, same thing with the modeling on all these objects and these human figures. It's stable, not really. I don't see anything stable except maybe this tree. Well, slightly tilted, I guess you would say. Uh, almost stable, two tree trunks. Otherwise every single human figure is at some kind of diagonal. Perhaps this man is, or woman is closest being up, but even there, the bottom half of the body of that figure is not. So it's almost entirely dynamic. The largest mass would probably be the hillside if you count that as simple mass. And then maybe this group of trees. It's hard to tell. I guess that's one tree. Yeah. And then it would be the mother, the drunken mother in the front, because you can see all of her body. And colors, of course, warm on the human skin tones and cool on some of the clothing, the sky, the clouds, and the water. Okay. Um, there's a close-up, by the way. I took this at the, it's at the Prado in uh, Madrid. And when I went there, there was a lecture in English about this painting, so I took some notes. <laughs> okay, this painting will be probably the one that you'll remember most from this lecture, if you remember anything. There's so much to say about it, we're only gonna be able to talk about the most scandalous, absolutely. If you think that last painting was scandalous, which it was, this painting should have been banned everywhere in uh, Christian quote Europe. It almost was because it depicts every type of sinful behavior known in Europe at this time. It's so famous. You probably have seen pictures of it. Some of you have even heard of it. It's called the Garden of Earthly Delights. 
garden of earthly delights. Looks like it's out four words. The artist's name Bosch, B O S C H, and the date is 1515. Now, this is a triptych, okay? That's the large central panel. We're going to see each panel, some of the details. And, and you know, I'm going to go ahead and tell you there's some controversial stuff here. I have to be careful how I say it, but you can't ignore it or else the meaning won't be clear. There's all kinds of uh, questionable, we'll say, human behavior going on in this uh, three, all three of these panels. And we'll talk about just a few of the lowlights or highlights in just a minute. But first, what is it? It's a triptych, no question. Central panel, two smaller hinge side panels. This was meant for a church. And it was meant to be a, the artist himself did a sermon against sinful behavior, a warning to people who want to engage in these kind of uh, perverted activities. So what are those? Well, we start out with this panel. So that's the meaning is about each of the panels. So just to get the highlights here. Okay, let's start out with actually, wait a minute. I have a separate yeah, view of that. Let's get it. Right. There we go. This is the uh, Garden of Eden panel. There's Jesus. Never mind it in the Bible. He didn't come along till that. Even the Bible says thousands of years, <laughs> whatever you believe it. Yeah, wasn't in the same time frame as they were. But here he is down on earth in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. He's there to warn them not to engage in sex. <clears throat> what does that mean? Or how does it have anything to do with this painting? Well, this is a tree full of phallic symbols. There's no debating these things because the artist didn't deny them. They were known symbols at the time and he painted them more graphically than most. Uh, some would even say they're a couple of diseased. Let's <laughs> see if you look closely. Anyway, just say that is a tree full of phallic symbols. And then down here is the female organ of uh, quote unquote, supposedly a cesspool depicted as though it were the equivalent of that. It, it's obviously controversial on several levels now, even more so in some ways, because the artist is just going with those biases, prejudices, stereotypes, whatever phrase you want to use, that the Catholic Church was trying to instill in their followers about not doing these things. Never mind that so many people at the upper end of society, from royalty to the church officials and famous wealthy people did these things anyway. How else, how would this artist know about them? This is the strangest image on this panel. It gets much stranger. Is that a face, two eyes, a mouth, and a pointed nose? Most historians I've read think it is. But what is it? Is it some kind of strange crab-like creature? And is that a sea of caviar, which was considered sinful because it had to be imported all the way from Russia, right? Or nearby parts of you know, uh, Eastern Europe? And only rich people could afford it. And of course, it's a luxury food when most people were starving, barely able to feed their families. So that could be the, the sin of excessive consumption symbolized by that. But now we don't have to guess what these sins are. Again, you remember, I'm putting this in the context of what the Catholic Church would have thought of this, not today's standard. Okay, here we have biracial love, interracial, however you want to call it, a white man and a black woman, absolutely taboo at that time against the law in this country until I was in high school, I think before some states finally, the Supreme Court actually forced them to, gave up those ridiculous laws against interracial marriage, or in this case, lovemaking. Okay, that's controversial. Then we have a man with a giant condom on his head. Yep, they had condoms then. Henry VIII forgot to use them and died of syphilis, but many people did. <laughs> And if they did, they might have protected themselves. They're a man with sheepskin. So he's got a condom on his head. He's about ready to go party. Okay. We're just getting started. Then we have two women, clearly, total heaven. Very much, of course, a Catholic teaching. Again, I'm just giving the mores of the time that this painting was made. Then we have necrophilia. This is a dead man coming up out of the water, coming back to life to eat grapes with two other dead bodies. And I guess it's somehow that their desire for whatever earthly flesh transcends their state of decomposition. Here's a man having carnal knowledge of bushes. Okay, you get the idea that this, then we have an orgy scene over here with these llamas and donkeys, right? Llamas were just being known from, well, maybe they weren't yet known from the world, but that definitely looked like a llama. So they probably had seen a few by this time. You know, Spanish conquistadors were starting to explore 
uh, Central and South America. In any case, it's a, an orgy scene with these people looking towards the next panel. So let's go see what they're looking to get involved in. Okay, here we have drug abuse. Uh, both poppies, the poppy and strawberries were symbolic of uh, extremely powerful drugs that of course were available. And then we have the Richard Gere syndrome. <laughs> I don't know if anyone knows what I'm talking about, the urban legend that's not true about Richard Gere and the gerbil. Uh, never happened, but there are, you know, other precedents for this kind of uh, behavior, which of course would have been, again, totally against the law and the teaching of the Catholic Church. Here we have women uh, leaving a sheltered place and one of them carrying a giant fish. I'm not going to go with, there with what that means. <laughs> I'll let you guess. But these are women giving away cherries. Again, you decide if you want to interpret that in your notes or just otherwise make a mental note with an owl, which is symbolic of evil and the knowledge of evil. In other words, if you know you're committing a sin and you do it, it's worse than if you do it innocently, like supposedly Adam and Eve did. These women are willingly wanting to give away their virginity that much. I think it's not too controversial to say. And here we have another giant condom, but this one's so big it forms an umbrella around three people for a threesome, I guess. Then we have a man with a giant olive for a head. I have no idea what that symbolizes. With a woman, very interested in what he's saying. And we have more interracial love right? Black man and a white woman. And then this is my favorite detail. What is that? That is a self-portrait of the artist. Now you look at his face and I don't know about the rest of you, but I see a knowing grin. I think that this man knew all these behaviors because he had participated in most of them. Most of his life is a mystery. No one's ever figured out what he did before he started painting. And he only painted for a few years and he died young, like in his late thirties or early forties. Nobody knows about his earlier life, but I'm guessing he participated in some of these activities. And if that's not enough, we finish up with this and then we'll do a formal analysis. And we'll do one more painting and we'll call it a day. Now stick around for any questions you have. Okay, so this is the damnation panel. You could say hell panel, but that's kind of an awkward way of saying it. So damnation panel of uh, the scene of hell. These are soldiers who had, uh, of uh, actually what they are, is soldiers of the devil. You could say the demons assigned by the devil to torture, burn, rape, and pillage a, a town where souls of other soldiers who had done that on earth were condemned to be treated the way they treated innocent civilians. So here Bush is making a moral statement that might be even more current today by you know, war crimes. The concept of war crimes, the phrase is new, but the idea of it being wrong to harm innocent civilians goes back at least to the Renaissance. So he's saying it's wrong to have done that. So if you were one of those people, you're gonna be punished with the crime you committed while you're on earth. Let the punishment fit the crime. You could. So that's what this is. This is burning villages where these soldiers that have, you know, I mean, these, these agents of the devil uh, have done to this village and the souls of the guilty dead soldiers who did that kind of behavior are being punished in the same way they were treating people. Then we have a phallic symbol. Now, this is Sarah Gill told, told her class about this. I listened to one of her lectures. I wouldn't have necessarily assumed that, but it is. And of course, that, that looks like a feather or a knife blade and two ears, but it's supposed to be a phallic symbol and it's cutting uh, people in half, the men who misuse that part of their anatomy. And here we have an instrument of torture a bagpipe. No, actually, it's not. I'm Scottish. I can say that. Half Scottish. This is some kind of early pre bagpipe instrument that had a similar sound. And music was considered sinful in many cases because it didn't entice people to do sinful things, supposedly, again, according to the Catholic Church. Here's another possible self portrait. It might be of the face of uh, Bosch. But if it is him, he doesn't look so you know, cocky here, does he? He looks a little sad. Maybe it's him thinking, I am still going to pay for my own sins, even though I'm trying to warn people against them. And here we have a glutton being eaten alive by dogs because he was too greedy during life, either, you know, for food or, or money or whatever else it was. And we have one more detail here. Uh, that's it upper part we saw. And then down here we have uh, nuns dressed like pigs or pigs dressed like nuns. Now, if you want to see it, and that would be, of course, corruption within the Catholic Church is being symbolized by this comet here, which is surprising in a way that that wasn't a reason this painting could have been banned by the church. Here's more punishment gluttony. Here's a giant demon, almost frog-like, right? Eating a human being who then he sh sh 
jetting, is that the word, out the bottom? <laughs> and then they're going to go back up along this slippery, looks like almost like a, some kind of tongue-like structure, back into his mouth again and over and over. And finally, two musical instruments, both of which are being used to torture musicians who played at orgies or whatever parties where sinful behavior happened. So you get the idea. This is pretty a remarkable. I'm going to go back to the first view to do the overview of it, because if it's on the exam, that's the view you'll have the whole thing. It has a high possibility. I'm not saying it won't be cut, but I'm thinking I'll probably leave it because it's such a famous painting. It is completely balanced, left to right, top to bottom. The figures are arranged carefully, left to right and top to bottom. Now, some people see there's more figures here than above, but when you add these objects here, there's, you know, balls of metal balls, whatever they are, and these strange structures, which we don't even know what they are. I think it's roughly about south to bottom, but you, you decide if you think it's weighted toward the bottom. Rhythm is obvious with human bodies, arms, hands, legs, and the animals, and uh, various uh, trees and plants. The colors are warm on the landscape, cool in the distance on the mountains, warm on the human skin tones, and of course, cool on the water. Uh, and then there's thin outline on all the figures. I don't see a straight line in it. Not really. The closest thing might be Jesus standing upright and the trunk of that phallic tree, maybe, but the part, top part of it is not. It's all diagonal. So it's almost entirely dynamic. Uh, and then we have some texture, as always, super sharp and realistic, as is the modeling on everything throughout it. Uh, here for space, we do have all the techniques. We have atmospheric perspective on the horizon. You see it there. We have scientific perspective. There would be a vanishing point in each of the three panels. Horizon here is in the village, right? And then we have overlapping, foreshortening, and diminishing size of the human figures and the landscape. Um, and let's see, colors, right, warm and cool. I think we covered it. Okay, let's do one more slide. Try to decide which one I should. Yeah, we're going to start with him. So let's finish with this one. This is Eisenheim uh, Crucifixion. Crucifixion is C R U C I F I X I O N. Crucifixion. One word. Eisenheim is a city in Germany. I'm not saying I won't cut this. So it has, you know, less likelihood, but not totally zero of being on the edge of Eisenheim. I S E N H E I M. Alter piece is one word. I think I spelled it already. Alter A L T A R. Alter piece. The artist's name is Grunewald. Or some people say just Grunewald, G R U N E W A L D, 1515. This is a mannerist piece of art, and I will not give you that. It's the only definition you have for today uh, mannerism, very short definition. It's a period from uh, 1520 to 1600, or you could say that period from circa, you know, about 1520 to 1600, during which artists created their own unique and exaggerated techniques, in which artists created their own unique and exaggerated techniques, period. They were experimenting a bit with just not totally strict realism. For instance, with this piece, this is Jesus, in case that word doesn't ring a bell with some of, some of you guys taking notes. That means the moment in which Jesus is, you know, crucified, nailed to a cross, and dies. Okay, what's unusual about this, since we're running short on time, I'll just tell you, is the flesh. The flesh is rotting off his body. Look at it. That's never been in a painting of Jesus before this, at least not a famous painting. That was breaking with the rules of Renaissance painting that he would show, and the Catholic Church's teaching. Jesus supposedly, you know, remained intact his body for days and then he went to heaven and all that, you know, according to the Bible. Here he's shown like a normal human body would be rotting away after he, he died. He's been on the cross three days in hot sun with you know, almost no protection. Another thing is the pain that he was suffering. Of course he would have. You put nails through anyone's hand and hang their body, but their hands are going to be in severe pain. Hey, look at his fingers. They're showing his obvious excruciating reaction to the pain he's under, showing he's, what, weak? That's what the Catholic Church would have said. That's not right. Don't dare show that. But the painter is saying, no, no, this is for what people really would have felt at the time. If, if he was, part, at least for a while, he was on earth, he was a human, right? According to, even to the way the Bible's written. 
while he was here on earth, he was human, well, he'd feel the pain and it would show. And then the last thing that most upset, there's three things that was made this controversial. So I gave the first two. And the last one is his feet are not practically in the dirt. No other crucifix has ever shown Jesus like before this. He's always way up above us. You know, we have to look up to see his feet, even let alone his head is, you know, 20 feet up in the sky. Not here. His feet are dragging almost in the dirt and you can even see his blood. All of those things were controversial and, and offensive to the Catholic Church. So they refused to allow this painting to be exhibited. But guess what? The people in the church, the town is, in Germany is called Eisenheim. They liked the painting so much, they went ahead and said, we're not letting you take it out. And they defended the painting. This is sort of the first opening shot in the Protestant Reformation. It's not a minor fact. <laughs> that changed the history of the world, if you think about it, certainly in Europe at least, because the whole idea of having you know, the Catholic Church say and dictate everything to everybody, including art, was beginning to crack, right? Beginning to fray, weaken. And one of the first examples of this uh, rebellion against Catholic authority in the arts is this painting. So it makes this a seminal work of art. There's no question. It was violating so many of the stricter rules that were supposed to be enforced against art that criticized or showed anything controversial that wasn't a part of the Catholic Church teaching, which this did. Down below, we'd be really quick and do a form analysis, and then I'll stick around with questions. That's supposed to be Mary, and look, she's dressed like a, a peasant woman. Well, she was. She might have been dressed in rags. You can hardly even see her, her uh, blue coat here. It's almost gone. So that also could have been controversial, or would have been, for the Catholic Church. Oh, she's always shown as the Queen of Heaven with bright blue robes, not here. And then this is the other Mary, perhaps, Mary Magdalene, one of the other disciples. And then we have to guess, this is John the Baptist, the guy that converted Jesus to Christianity, holding a Bible with his hippie hairdo and long beard. And that sheep is supposed to symbolize Jesus coming back down to earth many, many centuries later, supposedly, uh, to you know take people back up to heaven. So that's the future symbolized by this. Now that would have been just a traditional Catholic symbol, but it wasn't controversial. Okay, then we go with the meaning form analysis. Balance, Jesus in the middle. Some of you say, well, the line is, you know, here. Okay, if you want to be technical, but see, there's three figures on this side. I think it's roughly balanced left to right, but clearly unbalanced toward the bottom since there's this empty sky in the upper half uh, behind Jesus. There is, of course, strong modeling on Jesus's body and on the clothing of all the figures uh, and in the sky even because it's supposed to be at night I, I guess it has to be a night scene what else could it be and then we have the semi texture on the dead and rotting flesh on the wooden cross on the robes even mary's faded blue robe it's all realistic the outlines are thin it is stable on jesus's body you could say his arms are diagonal yes but it's because of the angle that they're pinned on the cross, but the cross itself is stable. So mostly that crucifixion part is stable. And so at least is uh, John the Baptist. These two figures are leaning over Mary somewhat. It's more stable than dynamic, but it's a mixture, the mixture. And then we have the largest math, e easy Jesus. And then I guess these two figures, the other Mary, uh, and then John the Baptist, and then Mary. For space, you have overlapping, foreshortening on the rocks behind them. Uh, I don't know if there's much anywhere else. Oh, on the ground, yeah. So foreshortening, overlapping. I don't see any diminishing size, and you don't see atmospheric perspective because it's a nighttime view, but there probably is a horizon line. I think it's right there. Yeah, somewhat in the rocks. So then maybe there is a vanishing point. So it probably has scientific perspective. The colors, of course, are warm on the human skin tones and all the robes and even on the cross, the only cool colors are the sheep and uh, the other Mary's robes here. And like, of course, the Bible and Jesus is loincloth. Okay, um, any questions? I stick around, like I said, as long as there are questions that anyone has about anything we covered today or about your uh, papers. Anybody? Yeah, can I start with one? Sure, please go ahead. Uh, with both this piece and then the one, actually, maybe like the last three or four, would that not be considered the chiaroscuro or however you say it? Because it's yes, like, you're right. Bright. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. I just, you know, I was running short on time. So you're right. Though. I said very strong modeling in the night scene, but I should have just said it. You, you, you brought up exactly the right 
way to, if you were writing about this on, the, on either a test or for a paper or any painting that has these very strong dark backgrounds, yes, that is chiaroscuro, a very, very powerful use. You're right. Okay, and you had another question? Uh, me, um, not yet, maybe. Okay, that's, Give me a that's a good clarification. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. I'll try to remember to add that when I start the next uh, set of slides. Yeah, that's uh, okay. Uh, for the, you know, the, for the Monday class. Okay, any other questions? I think there was one person who had a question about the nine elements, but I don't think I even have that handout with me. But anyway, before we get to that, any other questions about the slides we saw today or about your papers? Now's the time to ask, or convenient, you can always ask later, of course. Oh wait, actually, I guess I do have one more if no one else is yeah. gonna ask. Sure, go ahead. Um, for the the garden of earthly delights or what are, yeah of earthly yeah. delights mm -hmm. um what go ahead what i lost you there uh oh did you did your microphone go off i didn't mute anybody hello hello okay maybe someone else has a question and hopefully she'll come back into audio <laughs> All right, but there was at least one other person at the beginning who said that you had a question, and I think it was about the nine elements. Yeah, Mark, it was me, and I know this. I know we've referenced like you know sometimes a painting will have five, some will have a different four, another one will have six, and I just want to be real clear when I'm doing my paper and writing my analyses. So if I name them, can you just say yes or no? Oh. There are nine elements which I will give you the broad answer to your, I think I understand the context of your question. You are required to write about all nine elements. I, I know what I'm saying. I want to make certain I'm real precise because when you do a review of a piece of art like this one that we're staring at now, right. sometimes you touch on five, another time yeah, four, I'm, six. I just want okay. to know the nine so I'm real clear. That's all. Uh, I'm, happy, I'm happy to name them and I just want you to confirm them. I don't understand your question. Uh, I don't do all nine because we'd never get through the semester. I only do the ones that are the most outstanding. And yeah, five should be the minimal. I usually try to make it six and sometimes seven. But I will do nine on every architecture slide because those aren't so obvious. It's, so it's you don't have to worry about them. I hope I'm asking a question in the broad sense and maybe relieving of any, any anxiety on this topic. You don't have to worry. If I didn't give it to you in class, you don't need to know it if it's on the exam unless you might be right that a couple times I only did five and then I should do the one more, in which case uh, those would be what you would see for yourself, but I, I could have overlooked one or two and I apologize if I did that, but I'm pretty sure I've given at least six, certainly today on each slide, usually a minimum of six. See, I said that at the beginning of semester and I think one since. As all I'm asking, Mark, is can you just name the nine elements? No examples, just name them. Don't you have the handout in front of you? Um, <laughs> It's right there, the nine elements. They're, they're all there, one through nine. So, I'll do I, that for you, but- No, no, no. okay, okay, that. time out. Then maybe I missed that. I might've missed that. I'll go back. I'll go back and look I'll at all the materials you. you sent us. But I, okay, and, I'll read it to you just because you you're, you have every right to ask any question about anything and that's what we're here for. But you do want that list in front of you. So when you write your paper, that's when you have to write about <laughs> nine. On the exam, essay questions, you only have to write about six of the nine elements that you choose. And that's why I give you, I almost always give you at least six in the lectures. Okay, here we go. Dynamic versus stable. Balance, a second. There's no order here. You order that you choose, it's up to you. Uh, a third one is rhythm. Okay, then line and then textures, you know, are they real or my, yeah, I did a lecture. If you didn't see it, you really want to watch that. Remember, I said it didn't record, so I just I gave everyone an email. I hope you saw it, which says that it's the same exact lecture is on R2.1 for, for week two. So you just replay that the first 45 minutes and you got all the nine elements right there and drawn on a board, you know, blackboard like I did in class. Uh, okay, so five, uh, fifth one would be textures. Are they real or simulated? Mass or volume? Okay, next. And then space, the techniques for space, right? We've covered those today, so I'm not going to list all of them. There are six of them within the techniques of space, right? Which is a single type of element. It's a broad category of elements <coughs> depicting space. <coughs> I'm going to have to take a break. My throat's parched right here. Okay, let me wrap it up. Color, of course, warm, cool, cool or neutral, and modeling, you know, like chiaroscuro, sharp modeling, or soft modeling. So those are the nine, but you have that handout. Right, I mean, it's got them all listed. 
And so you should look at that when you're writing your paper. And you can have it out during the exam too, remember, because they're open book. I hope that helps, okay? All right? Didn't get an answer. Okay, I hope that answered your question. Was there someone who wanted to come back in because they lost uh, their mic or something? Was somebody asking before? All right, one more time because uh, this is your chance to ask a question that's you know more urgent or immediate in your mind. Uh, whereas otherwise you can always email me in the time between each class. Anybody have any other questions that you wanna ask now about your papers to do two weeks from today, remember? So you want to be working on, or at least to pick the uh, work of art and start researching it, uh, if you haven't already. Um, okay, or anybody else have any questions about any of the slides we covered today? Or any one or two uh, details of formal analysis on this or any other slide that I didn't cover? Um, it's not about the slides, but what is, yeah. uh, what is the best time, if we have like any questions concerning the uh, the uh, the project that we've been assigned the paper. Um, yes the paper how would you like like is there like a certain like day time like or do you have like office hours it's or, now <laughs> it's right now exactly that's what i'm doing yeah i don't yeah. have formal office hours because they don't give us an office and i move back and forth all over the bay area practically each week so i i just stay after each class long enough to answer questions but of course you can email me at any time and that becomes a sort of uh, floating office hours in which I will respond. Oh, you know, voicemail, no one's used that. I can actually answer in more detail. I prefer voicemail. I, I don't know why nobody does anymore <laughs> because, you know, if I hear someone's question, they give me a phone number, I can either talk to them live so they get every detail that way from me directly in real time or give them a detailed voicemail if they have, like I do, a three minute time limit. But you can also, most people, of course, will just email me your question. But do you have a question now that you want me to ask? Because now's a good time. No, it's not being, uh, that was probably the only question. Oh, oh, I know what could help you and everyone else who's still, the few people still. I've told people this, but I don't think I said it today yet. If you want to, you can send me a, a draft of part of your paper before you finish it. And I will double check and see if you're missing anything. But don't wait till the day or two before it's due. You should do that at least several days before the due date. You know, a, a, a PDF, uh, you know, in an email to Mark W at AOL. And then I'll look at it and see if you're missing anything. If you want to, you have that option too. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? All right. I think we've covered a lot today. And uh, you guys now, hopefully, when you take a few minutes, um, sometime over the next few days or by the weekend, you should be starting to work on your, doing the research at least for your papers. Okay, one more time, anybody else? All right. Okay, we'll see you guys, take care.